On an extended agenda this week, we hear from the final two candidates for the Legislative Council election. Bankers Peter Reid and David Prichter give us a full account of their background and motivation to become national politicians. Do the skills obtained from running a bank equip you for running a country? So who is Peter Reid and why was he motivated to stand? My background is in finance and, and in banking and uh, you know I've, I've been lucky enough to work on the Isle of Man since 2009 at um, one of the, the, the large banks. And I must admit, you know, having been here and lived here, I, I, I absolutely love the Isle of Man, you know, so I probably put my cards on the table straight away that I've always been um, very much the person that sat at the table trying to get jobs here, trying to, um, you know, make sure that we do work here and also that we are successful in the Isle of Man for our customers. So that, that's been a big part of my life. And one of the first things that, you know, I found when I came here was just how many people um, like myself came over to the Isle of Man and fell in love with the place and were doing things in the community and doing things in the island that, you know, were just amazing in their own time. So the, the, the biggest reason I want to you know, become um, an MLC is because I want to put something back in. The island has been brilliant to me. Um, I genuinely have, have, you know, worked really hard to put the island first wherever, I, wherever I've worked in the bank over, over those years. And that's been about the people that work with me and also about our business and the way we look after our customers here. And I guess, you know, if you look at my background, you know, I, I joined the forces straight from school. Um, I then sort of had a few years after that in, um, in, in being a buyer for a company, traveling around the world. And then f from there, I started off at the, the base level in banking and worked my way up. So I've, I've got a lot of really good experience in terms of understanding what the work actually is and how things actually work. And then more laterally, sort of running a bank and then going on to running the bank internationally for, 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 for Lloyds um, was, was a real opportunity for me to sort of understand as we closed other areas of the world down um, and became more UK and Isle of Man based, we, we actually had an opportunity to pull work into the Isle of Man and create a centre of excellence. And so, you know, it's genuinely trying to give back, put back in and you try and return the, the brilliant life I've had here and the way that people have treated me and the way the government have treated us, you know, I have to say, we've worked very closely with the government, with, with legislature as well, in terms of some of the acts that have been passed. Um, I've been involved quite heavily on the educational side as well, because we've been um, putting education into some of the schools and into the other banks and financial services through the London Institute of Banking and Finance, the IOD. And so, you know, it's just my way of trying to be a part of, you know, the solution of helping the island rather than maybe someone who's sat on the side criticising things and saying, well, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? So that's genuinely, you know, my reason for wanting to do it. Is, is there anything particular that drives you politically or, or are you are you just a, um, more of a I'll see what comes in the day and, and, and try and fix things as I go along? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm always a person that wants to make things better, you know, to try and support and do things that actually are part of the solution of what we want and what we need to do. And if you think about all the issues that we've got at the moment, you know, there's so many things, just not, not just to do with the economy and young people and jobs and, you know, people being able to even survive in this day and age, but also around the, the way that things are happening, you know, with the environment. And they're things that I really believe in. And if I could in some way support, you know, what we're doing on the island and bring things forward, with, you know, with supporting the MHKs, in what they're trying to do to make that better and make us a, a successful island. That, that's really what drives me. And it's the same as when I worked, you know, for, for, for the bank or when I've worked in committees or when I've done stuff with, you know, sort of the third sector. Whenever we've been involved in things, it's how do we make things better? How do we contribute to people every day? And at a, at a very simple level, not trying to be clever about it. 
What do you think the the role of a member of the Legislative Council is? <clears throat> to me, <clears throat> it's I guess it's three things. I, the first thing is in the scrutiny. So, you know, I've been quite heavily involved in um, adopting legislation in a really changing environment and, you know, reacting to that across lots of international borders um, and in sometimes contributing towards that legislation in terms of the feedback that we give. Um, this is different in that it's actually looking at the legislation and scrutinising it. And it, I guess, to me, I try and bring things back to being simple. You know, does it do what it says on the tin? Is this what it was actually trying to do? So the devil's always in the detail for me. And it's getting into that and really scrutinising it and making sure that it is right and it is the right thing to do and what was actually intended. So scrutiny is the first thing. I think the second thing is around support. Um, and when I say that, it's supporting the process, but also all of the MHKs. But, you know, they've been elected. They should be actually putting the things forward that are going to make things better. So it's supporting them in what we do. And I guess the third thing is is trying to contribute in a way to the solutions. So, you know, that, that to me would be having the opportunity to serve on maybe some of the committees on the island in some of the areas, maybe, you know, things that I'm used to dealing with, but maybe some that I'm not, where my expertise could actually be utilised. Uh, should you be asked to join a department, would you, would you join? 100%, absolutely. I, I think personally... I think that's really important to to give your expertise because if you can add some value and there's so many good parts of the island I mean when when I was um, working in banking the post office was a big part of what we did I, I really think the post office is brilliant you know I've always loved the post office the things they do they've supported us with lots of things but it's a fantastic service that we just take for granted you know, that's something, just one, one area, healthcare. Um, the last few weeks I've been working um, in, the, in the health service in Manx Care um, on some of their big projects. And it's, it's amazing when you see the dedication that people have there and the, the actual focus that they have for their, for their customers, as I would have called, patients, you know, and this is life and death stuff. But the amount of time they commit and the way that they actually do things... It is amazing, and I know we all take it for granted. So to be involved in something like that, to me, would be a massive privilege. I would really, you know, relish that. There are the, the different camps in the House of Keys, aren't there? There are, there, there are some members of the House of Keys think that it's uh, it's inappropriate for uh, members of the Legislative Council to sit in in departments of government. How, yeah. would, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I think if you have expertise that you can contribute, even if you were not an MLC, you would want to contribute, or I would personally. And I have done that in the past. I've sat on legislative subcommittees when I was in the bank. I, I sit on the um, biosphere technical subcommittee as well, where we're looking at you know whether the next... Um, um, application is going to be successful and hopefully you know we can renew that because we're the you know we're the only nation that's a biosphere which to me is amazing so you know i i think it, it is something that we should be involved in i feel strongly about it um but also i would say you know they've been elected they've selected you and you know if you have that expertise to just sit there and not support just doesn't seem right to me so we should take advantage and hopefully there is a diverse range of expertise within the in the legislative council you know I, I don't think it should just be a group of solicitors or, or people that have all they've ever done is, is legislation because you know you, you have to understand that what's happening actually out there as well and, and you know be close to what people's issues are to understand what when things go through the impacts of those so, yeah, I, I, I do believe strongly it should be. And in terms of the, that relationship between Keys and, and Legislative Council, um, when is it right for members of the Legislative Council to challenge the House of Keys? Well, I guess that's in the debate, <clears throat> but I, I, I probably see more of, you know, that, that comes under the scrutiny that, that I talked about. And, the, you know, rather than um, trying to break things down, is trying to build things up. So more of a supportive role. And, you know, if you have, for example, expertise in areas that you could contribute to the debate or you have opinions from people that you respect in the community, 
that's the sort of thing that could actually give people a different viewpoint. So I think it's more of a building piece than a, than a breaking down piece. And, you know, what I would hope is, if I were successful, is to be able to contribute to the debate. But, you know, at the end of the day, must understand that I, I would be there for scrutiny and, and support rather than actually setting it. And I think that's, that, that's where the line sort of stops for me personally. OK, uh, and... Uh I suppose the other obvious question uh, is, uh, you know, if, if you are so, uh, politically switched on and you're wanting to uh, to represent um, or, or to, to to give what what you have to to, to support the uh, the Isle of Man, the the people, the government, uh, why would you not stand as a member of the House of Keys? It's it's a it's a really good question that, and, and it is something I've thought about because. You know, over the last couple of years, people at work have approached me and said, you should do that. Um, I'll be honest with you, I I would prefer to be in in the position where I'm scrutinising and supporting than actually doing that. And the reason for that is I love detail. Uh, I'm I'm probably a little bit sad in that way. I've always been, you know, a person that does process re-engineering at work. We, We look at where the customer value has been and, you know, getting into the finite detail and I really enjoy that and I know a lot of people will be wincing when I say that but that's something I love doing and that's what really attracts me to the role in terms of your first part of it that scrutiny and getting into the detail I mean you look at some of the um, the acts that are there you know a few years ago we went through them and there's like the the Derby Square Act of 1945, you know, and I was reading all about it thinking, this is just amazing, the, the Explosives Act, you know, the, there's so many diverse things and it's almost like everyone could be a little adventure in terms of you understanding it and having a view on that because these are things that in everyday life are important. So uh, that's the part of the role that I actually would enjoy the most and I'm sure that a lot of people wouldn't, but I, I, I do. In, in relation to law, I mean, you, you mentioned a few acts there. My my absolute favourite when I was Agriculture Minister was the uh, Agriculture Act. I think it was 1916, but I, I forget the exact date. And it basically said, and the and the, the minister or the, the chairman of the board, whoever it was, the, the department, uh, shall do whatever else it thinks fit in support of Manx agriculture, which, is, which was a wonderful piece of legislation as far as a minister was concerned. However... Um, the, the, there has been a trend uh, with the Attorney General's Chamber's uh, drafters to move away from uh, having those very general bits of legislation into something much more detailed and specific. Um, where would you stand on, on those two camps? Should the legislation be as free as possible to allow um, par- well, ministers, par- parliamentarians to, to crack on and, and do good stuff? Or should it be prescriptive to ensure that uh, ministers don't get a bit too big for their boots? <laughs> I, I personally think there has to be a balance because I, I go back to when you look at the acts, there's always a heading on there that tries to tell you what the purpose of this is. And that's my bit about does it do what it says on the tin? If, if, you, if you look at that, and we've had this where there's been a lot of legislation that's been passed in finance sector, um, you know, not just for banks, but insurance companies and also for CSPs, things like that. If, if you look at that, it's how can you use that on a daily basis? Is it actually workable? You know, because often the legislation is written in a little dark room, you know, with an expert that does it. And then it gets sent out for people to to look at it and say, well, actually, you've missed this or you've missed that. So I think it's really important to not be prescriptive to the point of, you know, it's almost too binding. But it has to be balanced in that it's workable, but it does what it's supposed to do. So, you know, we think we have to take a step back and say, does it actually do what we're trying to do? And does it give, you know, the correct direction for that to happen? So that that's sort of, it's not one left or one right. It's probably a little bit more in, in the middle. But going back to that purpose of the act, does it do that? In, in terms then in, of your scrutiny of, of uh, a bill that would be before you in, in LegCo, um, what, what would be the, th- the key things that you would look for regardless of, of what, what the subject matter was what what would be the, the things you'd be looking for uh, as a kind of a, a first troll through um uh, it, it, it in legislation 
I guess it would be the same as we have been doing. You know, when I sit on boards and, um, you know, I've sort of run large parts of organisation, the first bit is the context of what you're looking at. So what's the background to it? Because what's on paper isn't everything. It, all you're looking at is the act. But if you actually look at the context of why this has been put in place and what is it trying to do, that to me is the, the most important first thing. I think the second thing is, particularly where you know sometimes things have to be changed slightly to get everybody to agree to it is to make sure that it's not been compromised to the point of actually not doing that first thing of the purpose so because often what i found is when when you get lots of people trying to agree something they might make sacrifices to get it through but it doesn't then end up actually doing what you originally wanted it to do so i'd, I'd come back again to you know that scrutiny has to go back to that purpose. Are we on track? Does this actually do that? And will it do that when it's in the real world? The, the last thing is the impact, because every action to me has a reaction. So when you put some legislation in place or when you do something, it's going to have an impact in the, you know, the wider world. And you have to really think about that to say, what impact will this have? Not just on the people that might be really positive for it, but what about the, the negatives of it as well? So that, that's how I would look at scrutiny. Members of the Legislative Council are elected by members of the House of Keys. Uh, some are quite content with that and seem to think that's fine and nothing to see here, uh, move, move along please. Others have quite a, a, a strong view that uh, that means that you are not representative um, and um, you know, certainly not representative of the public. So, how if if you aren't representative of the public, how are you able then to make uh, deci- national policy decisions on on the public's behalf? Do you have any particular view on on how members of the legislative council are elected? Yeah, I mean, I, again, my opinion is that you know the, the MHKs are elected by the people. So indirectly, you know, I do feel that the MLCs are getting, you know, that election through the people because if the people didn't elect that person in in the first place, they wouldn't be deciding on who's there. So the process of actually, um, you know, getting four people initially to almost say, yeah, this is a decent person to put forward and then for them to actually choose from that, um, you know, the, the Legislative Council, I think is a good process personally. Um, you know, because if you if you go out to election for the MLCs, that, that could be the alternative way. Well, it goes back to your point before about, well, why are you not just not an MHK? You know, just have more MHKs. It, it, you know, so I'd, I personally think it, it you know, this, this point about election and selection. And I, I think that indirectly it still is from the people because they've elected the MHKs. In relation to the the. The, the work of, of government obviously we have a government plan there's an economic strategy that's been brought forward we've just had a budget which showed that we were spending something like 10 percent of our reserves on revenue uh, expenditure it is are, are we at a crisis point do you think when you say crisis point how do you mean in terms of the the, the overall budget or well the significant spending on 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 of reserves and uh, as yet a, a plan but not an awful lot of detail as to how that plan is going to be implemented to to rebalance the tax and spend uh, equation well I, I guess going back to that point about context that we talked about before you know we we've just come out of um a huge huge piece around covid and you know we look at we didn't actually go into recession in europe and the uk but it was pretty close to wasn't it and you rising interest rates uh, you know this is a really unusual time uh, we've had years of low interest rates which um have probably falsely allowed us to go well okay i can afford to buy this and i can afford to do that particularly with housing and there's there's a degree of rebalancing going on at the moment so I think if you look at the context, we are in a very difficult time economically. And if we look at the cost of energy and what's happening in Russia, that that is really serious stuff. And it is, it, it's having an impact, you know, on people's being able to buy things, their spending. And that is really worrying. So I think, yes, we are in a really difficult time. 
And that's where we do look to the government for that stewardship and direction. So, yeah, we, we are spending more. I appreciate that. But I believe we do need to spend more. And I think, you know, if you look at things like the health service that we talked about, you know, Max Healthcare, um, Max Care, it, it, the amount that we spend in there is a lot of money. But we should do, you know, it, it's the right thing to do. So I, I think you have to treat that in the way that it deserves, which is it needs a lot of attention. The, you know, the strategic plan that the government's come, come out with is trying to address that. And again, that's why I see that being an MLC is trying to be part of the solution and actually trying to support those areas with what expertise you have to try and find solutions. Because if we just sort of meander through it and don't do anything, we'll quickly find ourselves, as you say, with our reserves gone, you know, with an economy that maybe isn't as vibrant as it has been. And it's really important now, rather than any other time, to make sure we do the right things. And there's lots of big decisions around energy, around, you know, spending that, you know, the Treasury are trying to face into, particularly with that last budget that they, they came out with. Is there anything that uh, you look at in public life and think oh goodness I, I wish they would do such and such instead of what they're currently doing in public life um I, one of the things I, I get a lot of feedback from people about it and my experience has been totally different but things like planning you know the, the way that we look after our towns and and our villages so you know a lot of people talk about that and, you know, I do listen to that and people say, oh, you know, I, I didn't manage to get my windows passed through the planning uh, department because they were this big instead of this big. And I was trying to build a, a new house over here and I couldn't do it. And I, I'll be honest with you, my experience has been totally different. You know, my experience of planning has been they've been really supportive. I've been able to go and talk to them, particularly when we were moving buildings. We were working hard to try and reduce our footprint on the island in terms of energy and all that sort of stuff. And we, we got loads of help from the planning area and, and actually saying, well, if you do it this way, that would probably be OK, but this wouldn't. And, and I guess, again, looking at things like the Kroger piece, that there's a significant amount of talk about that at the moment. We've got all these energy reserves off, you know, off the coast, potentially. Again, being involved in that, I, I really do relish that sort of opportunity to get involved in in that debate because... You know, there's going to be people on one side saying, you know, this is an ecological disaster doing this. And then on the other side where the prosperity of the island, you know, could be increased massively and, and we, it could be used as a transition energy. So the, I, I do think there's areas like that that are quite important or very important. But at the, at the same time, often people are misinformed. They don't they get a snippet. You know, I'll be talking to someone down the pub and they'll say, oh, it's this and doing this with it and doing that. It would just be to make sure the communication's better so people are better informed. What what would the public actually see that's going to be different as a result of Peter Reid being a member of the Legislative Council in five years' time? I, th I think it's somebody that, um, again, has has applied scrutiny on, on their behalf in a way um, and made sure that we have stuck to that purpose of what is this legislation trying to do. That would be the first thing. I think, you know, the, the part about being a person that's focused on trying to do things that are going to make things better as well, that I actually did contribute, whether that would be in a department or whether that would be through that scrutiny role. And, and to be looked back on as somebody who had in integrity and that, you know, was always honest about things, that... If, if, if at the end of five years people said that of me, that, that would be unbelievable. So that, that's, that's what I would want. That was Peter Reid. Next up, David Prichter tells us a bit about his background. Right, um, we'll go back to the beginning where I actually started as a, an apprentice electrical engineer. Um, I changed that to an audiovisual engineer in the early, late 70s. Um, I was then seconded to people like Freddy Starr, Herman Hermits, Cleo Lane, uh, and eventually Normal Wisdom, which is a full circle almost. Um, in the late 70s, I decided to uh, join a computer bureau. Um, it was one of the first in the UK, um, started by an entrepreneur. We then amassed uh, clients such as mainly um, insurance companies, Laurentium and so on. 
and the company grew over the seven, eight, ten years that I was there. Um, we were then bought out by a major US operation um, and I decided then that time was to move on. So I went freelancing in the finance and computer arenas around the UK. In 1990, I decided to not say retire, but semi-retire to Guernsey. Uh, my partner got a job there um, and we actually went to live there in September 1990. And by December 1990, I decided to join the same company um, as a consultant. Um, I spent the next eight years traveling the world uh, to most of the offshore environments for finance, so insurance companies and banks, telling banks how to make more money and best use the, the staff that were limited in offshore environments. In 1998, um, I was enticed to join um, Abbey National in Jersey. So I spent the next two years flying from Guernsey to Jersey every day, helping Abbey National expand around the world. That was quite successful, and in the year 2000, they asked if I would move or relocate to the Isle of Man to set up a back office systems for the whole of the group, which I did. And we ended up with um, something like 350 employees in the island. In 2004, Abbey was acquired by the Santander Group. Santander had a, a, I'll say, a different approach to Abbey. Abbey was laid back and customer orientated. Abbey was financial driven and cost saving driven. I'd spent the last 10 years or so trying to save banks money and make them more efficient. So to me, Abbey National was a good fit. Um, the first thing they decided to do was close the Isle of Man which to me was one of their biggest mistakes. Financially and operationally and customer service wise, the Isle of Man was probably the best of all the branches they had around the world. It was also the most efficient. So in 2007, I managed to close, or part of us managed to close the uh, Santander Bank in the island. And I was asked to go back to Jersey and help them run the business from there. I talked to my family, we decided Yes, it was an option. So we started planning to go back to Jersey. And within three months, they'd actually relocated the role back to Geneva, which then put a different spin on the, the family process. Um, I have two sons here who live in the island with me. Um, the youngest son had just started uh, Ramsey Grammar, um, and he decided that he wanted to stay in the island. So we turned down the, uh, the role that was on offer for Santander. And we decided to, as I'd spent the last 10 or 12 years traveling the world, that I would try and start working locally as an independent. So I've spent the last 15 years working part-time as and when I wanted for local branches like Barclays and whatever around the island. Um, and basically that's it. Um, that was my career so far. Okay, and, and a very interesting uh, range of, of, of areas there. Um, in, in terms of motivation then to become a member of the Legislative Council, uh, what, what's your motivation for that? Well, I, as I say, I spent a lot of time in the finance industry and in IT. Um, my favourite part of that job actually is people. People made our business and it was... Now, I don't know if I should say this. If you go work and live in the Channel Islands, everything is regimented. You're, you're an outsider and you always will be. If you come to the Isle of Man, you're just a, a Manx person by default. It, it's a whole different culture and it, it was easy. So the answer was to stay here. And now when I actually think, well, I've done everything I want to achieve. I've wound down my business and my involvement in businesses. I live a good life and... When we had the M MLCs, um, I think there were two vacancies about 18 months ago, I thought that would be something that would interest me. And I looked at it and I think I was too late to get to that point of applying for that. So when this one came up, I thought, yes, this would do me. I could, I could do something here. I have a lot of skills that maybe could be useful. And what do you think the role of being a member of the Legislative Council actually is? And I'm, I specifically ask, what do you think? Because 
<laughs> you ask the MHKs and there's at least 24 answers. At least, yeah. Um, I think it's mainly, as as you say, people say they put a brand on it, they call it scrutinising. I would, I would, it's legislation, so it, it's something you will read, you will look at, you will review, you will comment, you can change, you can think about it. And I would probably base it on my experience. I like talking to people. I like communicating with people. And I would like to see people benefit from what I could achieve. I like, I, I like the idea of looking at some legislation. What is the impact it has on people? What is the financial impact of people? Everyone says, oh, we've got to do it. But then there are finance. So, you know, if you implicate somebody's life or change someone's life because of what you do, it, it, it could ruin their life. And I think it has to be fair. It has to be well, obviously legal. I'm sure the AG would check that. But it, it has to be fair in, in people's lives and not impact them too much if possible. And do you think sometimes um, that we don't do enough of that actual um, checking to see the impact on people's lives? That from what you say, do you, do you think maybe sometimes our legislation doesn't a allow for what is the, the real impact on, on people? Yeah, I think a lot of people will actually take a piece of legislation and say, does it comply with the rules and regulations? Yes. Does it comply with what we want? Yes. Let's implement it. And there are there are... The demographic of the, the people in the Isle of Man, there are different people, different salaries, different um, costs, different living, different. And I don't think we actually look at that so much. We we implement a one fits all policy. And maybe that's something we should consider more often. OK, um, so assuming then that you manage to get elected mm -hmm. uh, to the Legislative Council, um, would you be willing to serve in a department of government my first reaction is no my second reaction is i have certain skill sets which i've mentioned as some prior to even considering sitting as an mlc i offered my service to someone like dhsc i am interested in and pretty good at mass data and how to manage it when they brought out the single policy record for the dhsc um, I offered my services to help them do it free of charge. And then I wrote to the minister and said, what you're doing is wrong. What you would like to do is this. Can I apply for a job on the board of the Manx Care? So I did and got told I didn't have enough medical knowledge. <laughs> but what I was trying to offer them was a skill set that I thought they were lacking. And I still think they are lacking. I listened to, was it Laurie Hooper is now the DHSC minister, and he's tying in the single record to Liverpool. Now, my past experience will say Liverpool will build a system that fits their business model and it will be massive. We are a small island, 70 odd thousand people. We are but a local area for Liverpool. And we cannot, we should not, and we certainly shouldn't pay the price that they will pay for the software that will have to come here to manage our DHSC section. And is that something, uh, again, from, from your background that that you would say that we maybe do? We, we, we tend to be keen to, to follow the lead of uh, our, our friends across the water with their 60 million people and um, perhaps our 80,000 people don't need uh, quite as much in, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We should be looking for a solution that fits our, our business model. We are, in my terms, a small bank, not a national bank. Yeah, and we, we could be more proactive in how we, we manage things, how we deliver things. We don't have to sit, I think Laurie Hooper quoted three to five years. Yeah, if this took in business more than a year to two years, we go out of business. OK. Um, and, and then the, I suppose the other uh, obvious area um, which uh, people will want to know is, uh, OK, you, you're interested in, in, in politics. Why would you not stand to be a member of the House of Keys? Right. My background has always, <laughs> has always been uh, the back office. I like doing something. I like producing something, I like delivering something. I don't like being out there talking to the public, getting engaging, 
being criticised, I, I, I would leave that to someone else if in preference. And I think that's what MHKs do. And it's not for me. And yet, you will be a national politician. You'll be sitting in Tinwald making policy decisions for uh, the people of the Isle of Man. And inevitably, um, if you are visible or, or audible in, in, in Tinwald, um people will find out about what you think and what you say and, and will potentially want to criticise that. I don't have a problem with people criticising. No, that's not a problem for me. I think that's, you know, fair comment. Um, and I don't mind having debates with people about it, but I just don't want to be in the limelight or out at front office full time. I'm quite happy for anyone to talk to me. In fact, I quite like talking to people. Yeah, but um, a back office suits me fine. OK. Um, and and uh, the, the, um, the, the role uh, can be turning up to Legco and, and, and Tinwald uh, and doing very little else. Or it can be the the complete opposite uh, end of the spectrum, working effectively every hour, every waking hour, every day, for five years. Um, how do you manage to get the the right work life balance? Do you think? I didn't achieve that until I came to the Isle of Man. Um, I would think nothing of working twelve, fourteen, sixteen hours a day, um, traveling the world, two weeks, three weeks of every month away from home. Coming here, I settled down. It was only pre or post pandemic I actually learned how to sit still for more than 30 minutes at a time. I've now got that under control. <laughs> I can sit, I can read a book, I can even watch, you know, a local film or a film without getting up and going out somewhere. So I've I've learnt and adapted to a quieter life. Okay. Um the government obviously has a, a range of, of new policies and plans and strategies um what do you think of the of, of the of the plans and strategies you know the overarching aims and objectives and and the the so so far anyway the what what we know of their plan to actually achieve these i've read these recently um the planning where they're saying they intend to grow things like the the um the population to 100,000 people between now and 2030, 2035. Um, I read this morning in the national press, the Dial of Man is the most second rated country for people wanting to go to, but only for retirees. Do we want 35,000 retirees here? Probably not. Do we want 30,000 people here? Can we cope with it now? No, don't think so. Not enough dentists, health care, schools, housing even. Um, could we cater for it over the next 30 years? Yes. Do we want to cater? I'm not quite sure why. The economy can be made and can be sustained as it is. Um, yeah, I, th I think we need to sit back and think about what happens really. It's easy to say we're going to grow to 100,000. But it's what we want to grow up with, I think, is what we need to look at. And and you say that the the economy can be sustained or um, presumably can grow um, without um, necessarily having the extra people. How how would you go about doing that? Well, to me, it's I've spent my life. Modern technology will relate relate or replace things that people do manually today repetitive jobs boring jobs people don't want to do it so why not automate it we, we have the technology we have it businesses are using it all the time they're closing bank branches to make way for atm machines they're doing it online they don't need resources anymore they don't want brick and mortar, bricks and mortar yeah, so there, there's there are a lot of efficiencies to be made and i think it's tiny isle of man did it we push down the route of going gaming now all the gaming zone to Malta and Eastern European countries so what are we replacing it with I'm not quite sure I don't see anything on the horizon yet we're still going to grow the the economy uh, banks are, are contracting their businesses here um, I think it's only Santander recently who's actually expanding but all other banks banks and branches are closing and they will continue to do that. 
Okay. Um, and presumably, if you know about making banks more efficient, do you know about how to go, how to make the public service more efficient? I don't think we've got enough time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, there are loads of ways I could think of making it efficient. Um, when I went to talk to some of the MHKs over the last few weeks, they're always telling me, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do it. I'm so busy doing this, which is probably true. But I think people could be more organised. I think they need to be not just the MHKs this refers to, but the whole of government. I go I go down to town and I try and pay my bill. And the online services functions in a way, but not in as an, an efficient way. Yeah, I think a lot more things could be done online. When I go to our local commissioners, it's all paperwork. It's all, well, you've got to see this department. Can you send that to this department? There, there's got to be a way of streamlining it. Now, the only, and this is, a, this is a, a real scarce one. The only one that is reasonably efficient to me is the tax office. <laughs> now, is that, that to me makes sense because it's quicker to get and easier to get money into government than it is to get it out of it. <laughs> So they've done it the right way around. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, well, hats off to the tax office yeah. then. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of democracy, um, there are those who feel that um, to be truly democratic, you need to have your national politicians, all of your national politicians, uh, voted in by the public. How would you answer that? I've had this discussion quite a bit recently. <laughs> Sorry. Um People are telling me that um, it's been going on for years. I've not obviously been aware of it until recently. But I can see the logic. I can see the understanding of people saying we don't elect MLCs. But then I started looking at it. People don't elect MLCs. They don't elect the chief minister. They don't elect the secretary. Um, secretary? Or speaker, sorry. They don't elect the president. They don't elect the AG. They don't elect the bishop. So a third of politicians are unelected. Mm -hmm. So should they do it? Well, yes. If they want to change it to be publicly elected, next time you an MHK comes to your door, you ask them, will you promise to get that done? Mm -hmm. I'll elect you on the basis of you will elect or change the constitution. But you don't have any particular missionary zeal on, on this one that mm. uh, you, you want to change the world? No, nah, none at all. No, I think some people can look at it and say it's been working for centuries. It's basically, you know, it's the same as the UK. They don't elect those, you know, the House of Lords or their Prime Minister or, it, you know. So if it works for the UK and it doesn't work for the island, change the Constitution. What drives you? politically what, what 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 gets you out of bed and, and makes you think yes i must p pursue I, I, this particular yeah. cause i don't think driving me politically is anything i've got i don't want to be political i like to be efficient and i like to be i like to achieve things i like to see things better and a lot easier i want to make life easier for people now whether that is helping to change legis legislation i don't know but I've spent my life changing things for people to make it easier and I would like to carry on doing that. I've now got, instead of travelling the world or running everywhere and working many hours, I've now got time to sit back and think about what I can do and what I would like to do. And I think this, this would suit me. I could do some, some benefit. And and then I suppose the, the other question, what makes you angry? Is, is it, Does anything make you angry or are you completely chilled and laid back? I can actually say I have never lost my temper. And this is, this is going to sound really weird, and I should really keep it to myself. My partner and I have been together for 46 years, and we've never argued. Gosh. Mm, well, never. Uh, well uh, if, if, if you're <laughs> not successful at being a member of the Legislative <laughs> Council, maybe you should write a book of how to. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Um, then, um, getting towards the end of the interview now, what would what would be different as a result of David Prichter being an MLC? What would people notice maybe in five years has changed? That's not so easy to answer, because if I was to sit here and be honest, I've talked to different people in the uh, House of Keys, and I've talked or tried to talk to MLCs. 
and I would probably say I understand the written text of what an MLC is supposed to do, but then I look at what they can do, and I think there are two different things. So I think an MLC has a job, a scrutiny, but I think it also, when I look at the, and this is going to sound awful, when I look at the amount of legislation that comes through, I think MLCs have sufficient time to do more work, to be more proactive. Now, it doesn't mean going into government and changing things. It means helping government. It means helping ministers. It means helping the general public. Any MLC is probably more capable of doing more than they currently do. Now, that may sound awful, but if I was in business and I was an MLC role in within the business, I would look at how a bank will run, but then I would implement it, I'd design it, I'd build it, I'd, and I'd take the whole process through to the end, and I would implement it into the business on how it should be used. When I was talking to people here in the MHKs, legislation is passed through the, the house through an MLC, and then it is handed to a department to implement now, the person who knows it best is the MLC member. Why don't they implement it how it was meant to be implemented? And I think they, they throw it almost over a wall and say, that's my job done. And that might be right and might be wrong, but that's my interpretation. And do you think sometimes part of the problem there in, um, for MLCs is because Keys members don't really have any uh, unanimity on, on what they think an MLC should be there for? Um, that that makes it more difficult. It does indeed. I think people need to sit back and think about what role they want to fulfil. Um, now, MLCs could do it themselves and define their own role and then get it agreed by the Chief Minister and M M the MHKs. And then people would know. But I think there is some confusion. Not confusion, misunderstanding of what they want. Some don't want them at all, I understand. But that's the, you know for them to decide. So if they did, it would make life easier for everyone. OK, um, and the main thing, the, the one thing that uh, uh, you would hope that you would be able to do differently um, as a result of being a member of the Legislative Council? Do you know, I don't know if there is something very specific. I think there are lots of, I won't say silly things, but there are lots of small things that can make a big difference. I don't think... If, if people started saying to me, I want MLCs voted by the public, I would do what I could to help them do it. But that's that wouldn't be a, an aim of mine. But I would do it because that's what someone, you know, the general public will want. And I think sometimes, and maybe I should say this, yes, I don't usually. But talking to the most of the MHKs, my opinion of them has changed drastically for the good which is quite nice to say. My opinion before was, yeah, just an MHK. But they do care, and they do work hard, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I could be part of this. I, I do like, there is there is change there, there is ways that people want to do things, but we don't see that, and I'm saying we, from the outside, we don't see MHKs doing that, but I've seen a lot of change and a lot of good things in the last few weeks, which surprised me pleasantly. That was the last of the 11 LegCo candidates, David Prichter. You can listen again to all the candidates by visiting Manx Radio's Agenda and Perspective LegCo candidate podcasts. So what insights can political commentator Alistair Ramsey give us on LegCo? The purpose, I think, I think we've lost sight of it because of the way that the role has changed over the years. Um, and people forget that at one point Legislative Council was the seat of of power, it was the seat of the executive around the governor who was the chief executive. LegCo was made up of crown appointments and they were the the dominant chamber uh, and the House of Keys was very much the, the poor relation and now it, it's gone the other way, leaving uh, the Legislative Council looking semi-redundant really. Uh, so there are mixed views about what it's for. And why do we actually need to have all these different separate uh, parts to Tinwald? Well, there's the there's the kind of history aspect, but I, I think I, I think it, it's useful 
to have a second chamber as a backstop um, just with that ability it's like a safety net really when you've got a, a fairly small and sometimes very inexperienced primary chamber um, why not have people standing behind them to just raise issues say you know did you really mean to do that and at most they can just pause things for a while um, the other thing is that increasingly the House of Keys is dominated very heavily by the executive. So there's a role there for LegCo on the scrutiny side to counterbalance that very dom heavy dominance of the, of the government. And is it doing that? Not visibly, no. Um, I think because there's this um, lack of clarity about what it's there for, some of the members see themselves primarily as scrutineers, but there's also this, uh, people who get involved in kind of government managerial roles. Um, you certainly don't hear a lot of scrutinising questions in public from MLCs. Um, you do occasionally, and you see some scrutiny work led by them. Um, but I, I think we, we could do with quite a bit more and, um, and a greater focus on that scrutiny. Um, and I think one of the reasons why they don't like to ask awkward questions is that they have been made to feel like like they're not a legitimate body mm. and that if they make a lot of noise, well, nobody voted for you, shut up, sort of thing. Former Chief Minister Howard Quayle ma uh, made, uh, or, or is reportedly uh, made uh, various sweeping comments about some of the members of the Legislative Council who were hauled into his office and told in no uncertain terms that their role was to support the government, or, or words to that effect, and no doubt if yeah. uh, Howard is listening, he'll be saying, no, it wasn't yeah. quite like that, but but that that's the perception. Certainly, that is the perception, over. and if it was true, it was quite an extraordinary episode, mm. given that they'd just elected in a, um, a large number of women in the interests of diversity, and the women were then told off for um, causing trouble. But that, you know, that's possibly a, a misrepresentation of what actually happened. Scrutiny itself is not perceived as a form of support, but actually it is because you're helping with the quality of decisions, quality of information and so on. So I think we really need to refocus on what LegCo is there for and, and make it primarily about scrutiny, that, de that detachment and that perspective from what's going on down in, in the House of Keys. Almost all the members are members of government as well as parliament, and a lot of people um, who who are have, have no interest in politics mm. uh, confuse the two. Uh, the, the, it is quite a, an important distinction, yeah. and all attempts so far at trying to reform things on the island so that we have less or fewer members actually as, as part of government uh, seem seem to have. have the fallen by yeah, the way, so it, it's. It, I think it's almost seen as not relevant to the Isle of Man. I remember the the late great Victor Neal when I was talking to him about this. He said, "Well, you know, down in the Westminster, they got time for that fancy business. But <laughs> we we haven't got. You know, we don't, we work differently up here." That was political commentator Alistair Ramsey. In just over a week's time, we hope to have the result of who will be elected to LegCo for the next five years. Let me know your thoughts and views on the programme by contacting philgorn at manxradio.com and get in touch if you have any ideas for future shows. Don't forget this programme is available as a podcast on Manx Radio's website. For now, though, I'm Phil Gorn. Garamayo. Thanks for listening.